So let's get started. Any course that is concerned with the fundamentals of electrical engineering has to be concerned with information. And that's what we're going to talk about today to get started. So it turns out what's really going to be important for us are signals and systems. So the first thing I'm going to do is define a signal. It turns out this definition is very simple. You already know what a signal is, it turns out, and we'll get, get through that very quickly. What's going to be more important are the various kinds of signals. How we electrical engineers think about signals, the different ways in which we think about and categorize them. And then I'm finally going to link information to signals. And it turns out this link may be a little bit tighter than you think. Uh, I'm going to say some provocative things, I hope. Finally, we'll talk about systems, which are the way you operate on signals. And we're going to put systems together to create what is known as the fundamental model of communication. This model is very, very important. We're going to return to it throughout this course because not only will, in the process of understanding it, will we understand how real communication systems work, but we'll also, the, when we put the various components together, we'll be able to apply the things that we learn in this course. So, what's a signal? So, the definition of a signal is quite easy. It's a function. So anything you've learned about functions in calculus, you've already learned about signals. They're exactly the same thing. There's no difference. So I can plot a signal. So let's say we have a signal as a function of t, which I take to be time. And I'm going to call my signal s of t. And there it is. That's a signal. That's all there is to it. Uh, don't, there's nothing more complicated about a signal than that. It's just a function. And before we get too far, I want to talk about electrical signals. And uh, there's some interesting aspects of electrical signals that have proven to be very important in the information age. As you know, electrical signals are voltages and currents and electromagnetic waves. Uh, but what's very important to appreciate is that they carry two different quantities. First of all, they carry power. When you plug into the socket in the wall, that's an electrical signal that's carrying power, which powers your computer, your refrigerator in the home, the laser printer in the office, all kinds of things. Very important. There's also signals that convey information. For example, the wireless signal you use with your cell phone to call one person is carrying information, is carrying what you're saying. Now it turns out we're not going to talk much about power in this course. Um, it's not our major concern. What is our concern, of course, is information. But you cannot design an information system without having some consideration about the power. How much power am I using to use to, send, to call somebody over my cell phone? How efficiently am I expending that power? These are going to be issues that are very important to the design of modern information systems. So we've got to talk about power a little bit, but we won't certainly focus on it. Uh, it will come up. So the various categories of signals, how do we think about them? Well, there's two broad categories, analog and digital. The analog signal is a function of a continuous variable. Here's my good old S of T again, and it's a function of time. And certainly time is a continuous variable, and we can plot it. Looks something like that, very crudely. The sinusoid, the sine wave, is uh, governed by three parameters. First is the amplitude, which determines how big the signal is. The frequency, F0, determines how often the peaks occur. If I were to whistle, that turns out to be an acoustic sine wave, at least approximately. The frequency of my whistle, the pitch of my whistle, corresponds to the frequency F0. Phase has to do with how the sine wave begins at the origin. So here we have a very good analog signal. It's a sine wave as an explicit formula controlled by three different parameters. Now the next analog signal I want to talk about though 
is a little different, and it's different in a very interesting way. So here's a plot of a segment of speech. That's me saying the vowel E. And what I want to point out is that there's no formula. The sine wave has a formula. There is no explicit analytic formula for speech. However, we are going to want to operate on signals to understand the structure of signals, whether there's a formula or not. The structure of the signal with a formula, like I said, is governed by three parameters. Here, we're going to have to think about what, and for the speech signal, what the structure of it is. And it kind of looks like a sine wave, but I think it, you can see that the succeeding peak values don't look the same. The peaks of these waveforms don't look the same. However, the peaks of every other uh, thing tend to look the same. This is even more apparent at the bottom, where there's the big guys, very negative peaks, and then the ones that are smaller, less negative, and they kind of interlace with each other. Well, that's a very tedious way to try to get at the structure of this signal. We're going to develop much more interesting ways and much more informative ways to under appreciate the structure of a signal. But we will have signals that don't have any sig formula. We'll have signals that do have formulas. And we have to develop methods by which we can appreciate the structure and process these signals, whether or not there is a formula. It's going to be very interesting for us. So the next kind of signal is a digital signal. And a digital signal is a function of the integers. It's a function of a discrete valued independent variable, which we are just going to take to be the integers. So here's an example of a digital signal. Uh, it's a sequence of numbers. So I intend for these numbers to be uh, read from left to right. And here's a plot of it, just for fun. So this goes across like that. And that corresponds to these sequence of values that we see across here. So from left to right to top to bottom, you see the values of my digital signal. Uh, so uh, I don't mean you, but I don't see much structure there. I don't quite see what's so interesting about this signal. Uh, I do want to point out before we get too far along about how I plotted it. This is what's known as a stem plot. And every value is drawn with a little line, with a little uh, bubble at the top to indicate the value. So this indicates that this function only exists at the integers. The value at 29 and a half doesn't exist. It's not even defined. This is a function only of the integers. That's what a digital signal is. So what is this thing? Well, it turns out this is a, another digital signal. This is text. And you may say that's a signal. Well, it turns out if you take position of the character along the line, the value of the signal is a member of the alphabet. So S of 1 is capital T. Well, that's a digital signal. It's a function of the integers. What's even more interesting about this example is that these two are the same thing. So I typed this text into my computer. Inside the computer, what the computer did was turn those symbols, the type characters, into numbers. So a capital T is 84. A lowercase h is 104, etc. So uh, they're exactly the same. So I think you'll agree that the text version you can understand the structure. You know it's English text, for example. It's not something random. It actually makes sense. Whereas if you look at it as a sequence of numbers, it's not quite apparent. And certainly if you plot it, it's even less apparent what the structure is. The structure of a signal may depend on how it's presented. Find it kind of interesting thing to think about. So let's talk about some other kinds of signals another way of categorizing them, and I want to talk first about images. So the speech signal we already talked about is a function of time. 
Images are functions of space, so they're a function of x and y. So uh, I can give you an example of a uh, black and white image. Uh, here's a picture of a woman. And you say, why are you showing a picture of a beautiful woman? Well, it turns out this image has been used in the image processing field for decades as a test image. And here's why. This one image contains a curve, contains some straight lines, contains a corner, contains a highly complicated area, something we call texture, contains a smooth uh, surface with a gradient of uh, shading, and it certainly contains a face, a very important thing. So if you're trying to develop an image uh, algorithm or image processing procedure, you want an image to test out how well it works. Well, you may discover that your procedure works very well on straight lines and curves, but doesn't work too well on texture. And so you want an image to test it with, rather than having a textured image and a straight line image, etc. It's a bit more convenient just to have one image you can run through and see how well it works on that. That's why uh, electrical engineers develop such test images. So this one has been used for decades because it has all the right things in it that you need to test out images. But is it a function? Well, I'm going to plot it. So here it is as a function. So here is the x and y. And this is what's known as a heat map. This is a way of plotting what we call two-dimensional signals, so that you can readily see what